Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to be here. Um, uh, this is a talk on, from a law professor. It's a talk in a sense on law, public policy, political decisions. A lot of talks like this are all about here's what is the right law to have, right political decision to have. This is what the wrong one is. Here's why we're doing it wrong. This is not going to be one of these talks. A lot of talks are about, well, here is what's actually happening in the world as to specific, specific thing. Here is what the effect of some policy has been. This is not going to be one of those talks either. This is a talk about thinking about a particular kind of policy argument. It's not by any means the only kind of policy argument that's out there, but it's a particular kind of argument that I think all of us have heard and many of us have made. Uh, at one point or another, actually on many, at many points, on many topics. One reason that I like to give this talk is I give talks sometimes about free speech. I give talks sometimes about religious freedom. I give talks sometimes about gun rights and gun policy. And some people are interested in each one of those things. But this, this kind of argument arises in all those areas. You might have heard slippery slope arguments as to speech, as to religious exemptions, as to guns, as to abortion, as to privacy as to uh, government regulations, as to tort law. Uh, these arguments are commonplace. They're often made, and they're sometimes made with great assurance. People say, oh, that'll get us out on a slippery slope, as if that's sort of the end of the argument. That, well, all right, that, I've won. Well, it doesn't quite work that way. But sometimes when somebody makes a slippery slope argument, they say, oh, that's nonsense. We could, we could stop. We don't have to slip down the slope. We can just stop halfway down the slope. As if that's sort of a dispositive answer. In fact, if you talk to philosophers, sometimes philosophers call slippery slope arguments a fallacy. Uh, but I don't think that's quite right either. I don't think we can either categorically accept these arguments or categorically reject them. The, both the, uh, any more than we can categorically accept or reject other kinds of arguments, like arguments about how some policies might have unintended consequences that make them bad ideas. Well, all right. That's an interesting general genre of argument. Uh, but the trick isn't to ask, is this a sound argument or is it an unsound argument as a general matter, because sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. The trick is to figure out how we can think through slippery slope arguments and try to figure out what's going on. Uh, and one reason this is actually a non-trivial trick is the word, the phrase slippery slope is a metaphor. And the one thing we know about metaphors is Metaphors are lies. They're by definition. They're, half, they're false. They have to be false. Think back to your high school English class where they talked about metaphors and similes. You can say someone is like a wolf in sheep's clothing. That would be a simile. That could be correct. It's probably more a matter of opinion, but you could say it's true. So if you say someone is a wolf in sheep's clothing, unless you have some highly unusual circumstances, that's a falsehood. It's a metaphor, and therefore, it is false. Now, sometimes a metaphor can illuminate a deeper truth. Sometimes, some metaphors are very useful for that, actually, in law. We often find that metaphorical arguments, if cast the right way, can be very persuasive. But how do you figure out if this is a metaphor, uh, uh, a slippery slope, or anything else, by the way, whenever I talk to my students, uh, uh, and one of them uses a metaphor, I, I say, well, wait, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. You're using this metaphor. How do we know whether it's a falsehood that reveals a deeper truth or whether it's falsehoods all the way down? And that's why I like to think about the mechanisms behind the metaphor. Whenever you hear somebody say something like slippery slope or something similarly metaphorical, the question is, what's really going on there? In the physical world, by the way, slippery slopes are not a metaphor. If you park your car on a slippery slope, it might slide down. There's nothing metaphorical about that. And we know what the mechanisms are. The mechanisms behind slippery slopes are gravity and absence of friction. But obviously, that's not what's going on in any literal sense in slippery slope arguments, again, as to abortion or guns or whatever else. There's got to be something else going on. The question is what? And that's an important part. In fact, that's the heart of the paper, is trying to figure out, figure out when you hear a slippery slope argument, what actual real world thing is it referring to? So, um, so I'm going to, uh, to spend most of the time talking about what these mechanisms are. 
Uh, but first, I have to give you some quotes, some authority. And the reason I have to give you that is law is the only discipline in which the phrase, that's an original idea, is a pejorative. When you're a lawyer and you're arguing in court, what you want to persuade the judge is that there's nothing original whatsoever in what you are saying. Because other respected authorities have said it again and again since the dawn of time, or at least since the dawn of the republic. Now, it's often not quite true, but that's what you want to, uh, to persuade the judge of. And at the very least, it would help, even in a scholarly analysis, even in a pragmatic and not rhetorical analysis, to ask, you know, these slippery slope arguments, people call them a fallacy. Well, have any sort of sensible people made these arguments? And it turns out the answer is yes. Here's one um, argument, uh, and, and this is from a pretty sensible guy. This is James Madison, president of the, of the United States, actually generally thought to be not a very successful president, but the, one of the principal drafters of the Constitution, the principal drafter of the Bill of Rights, generally thought to have been a pretty wise guy, co-author of the famous Federalist Papers. And here's how he spoke about a, a proposal in the uh, Virginia legislature in the 1780s to institute a tax, a three-penny tax, in order to support uh, the funding of, uh, of clergy, funding of teachers of the Christian religion. Uh, now, actually, the Memorial and Remonstrance is the name of the document. Um, against, against the, the, the proposed bill is a long document, much worth reading, by the way. I recommend it to you. And much of it is, is not about slippery slope arguments as uh, such. It says, look, this law just by itself on its own terms is a very bad law. But part of it is an argument that I think we can recognize as the kind of arguments that you hear people making in slippery slope uh, language. They say, look, the first step might seem not that bad to you. I mean, I think it's really bad, but maybe you, my listeners, don't think it's that bad. But boy, once you get out on the slope, really bad things will happen. Much, much worse than just this first step. So let's hear what he has to say. It is proper to take alarm at the first experiment on our liberties. In a classic slippery slope talk, take alarm at the first experiment. This first step is something that should alarm you, even though the reason I'm telling this to you is Presumably, you aren't alarmed yet, but you will be when I'm done with you, uh, the argument goes. The freemen of America did not wait till the usurped power had strengthened itself by exercise and entangled the question in precedence. This first step will set a really bad precedent for the future. By the way, note, he's not talking about things like we think of judicial precedents in courts of law, where there's a legal rule that courts should generally follow precedent, because after all, this is a proposed statute. Nothing says legislature must follow precedent. But he's worried that even a statute could set a bad precedent. The interesting question, why? They saw all the consequences in the principle, and they avoided the consequences by denying the principle. Classic slippery slope talk. Avoid the bad result. Avoid the bottom of the slope. Avoid the total gun ban by denying the principle, by refusing even this one little step in that direction. So that's a classic argument, again, worth keeping in mind that you know, a pretty sensible guy uh, made this argument. But beyond that, also worthwhile because it illustrates, I'll, I'll explain in more detail uh, 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 what slippery slope arguments are as I define them, but it helps illustrate this. You guys might not be that worried about this one little tax, but I tell you, if you implement this tax, this will set us down to a down the road to a much broader establishment of religion, that can't be good. Therefore, you should oppose this first step. There's some other examples. I'll, I'll skip this one, uh, but I want to give you one other, one other instance. This is from a quote in 1993 about Princeton, New Jersey. There was a proposal to ban, uh, to ban cigarette vending machines. Some of you may never have seen a cigarette vending machine in your life. In my lifetime, uh, not that long a lifetime yet, but pretty long. Uh, I, I remember seeing them, and then they vanished. Uh, and here's, uh, here's one of the arguments. Um, there's no slippery slope toward a total ban on smoking in public places, the vice chairman of this health commission said. The commission's overriding concern is access to the machines by minors. Don't worry about slipping down the slope to a total ban on smoking in public places. We're only after this one little step. 2000, last month, the commission, same commission, 
took a bold step to protect its citizens by banning smoking in all public places. In doing so, Princeton has paved the way, greased further the slope, for all the municipalities to institute similar bans. So the, again, when people poo-poo slippery slopes, think a little bit about these things. Now the careful listener might, have, might be saying now, well, wait a minute. We're not really sure that this helped cause this. We know that this was followed by this, but as we know, the fact that something is followed by something doesn't mean it caused it. Maybe there's some other third, third uh, phenomenon, maybe a broad growing hostility to, to smoking that caused both. So that's certainly possible. It's very hard in retrospect to know whether really there was a slippery slope or whether there was just some overwhelming pressure that would have gotten you towards the bottom of the slope no matter what. Uh, but still, stories like this should make one wonder. Maybe there is something to this metaphor after all. Let me be now give you, after giving you some examples, be a little bit more rigorous in defining this. What I mean by a slippery slope argument is something like this. Decision A, I'm going to use this A and B quite a lot. We're in position zero. We're at the beginning. There's a proposed decision A, a small step, small speech restrictions, small restriction on guns, on abortion, on privacy, whatever else, may be appealing or at least unobjectionable. To be sure, the people making this argument often think it is very bad indeed. But they're conceding for the purposes of argument that maybe it's not so bad. But we, we all agree that the result, that result B, the bottom of the slope, broader speech restrictions, broader gun bans, and so on and so forth would be bad. And if you endorse A, this might contribute to others enacting B. Not that if you endorse A, that will surely lead to B. Things are very rarely so certain in politics. Nor if you endorse A, you will endorse B. Because after all, if you will eventually endorse B, that's not a slippery slope. That's just you changing your mind. People presumably want to change their minds if their minds are worth changing. Um, but if you endorse A, others might enact B. Right now, B is politically off the table. But if you put it, if you implement A, it'll get on the table. And while you're still very much opposed to B, others will be able to enact. That's the model, and the question is why? Why would we think that two things, the first step and the supposed bottom, are yoked together this way, are linked together this way. Why can't we say, well, well no, no, no. We're going to decide on proposal A, and we're going to separately decide on proposal B. That way, if we think A is good and B is bad, we'll just do A, and we're going to stop, stop uh, uh, before getting to B. No slippage at all. That's what I'm going to be talking about. Uh, so I'm sorry. Let me just mention one other thing that may help, help explain this. One other way of thinking about it is maybe decision A if you help make decision uh, uh, A, will change the economic, political, or psychological conditions under which the others will uh, consider decision B. Maybe that first step will change the world. Right now, right now, B is off the table politically. But you take that first step, it will get to be on. And again, the question is, why would that be so? So far, I've been pretty general. Let me get more concrete. Uh, and let me give an illustration of a slippery slope. Uh, argument that people often make. Gun registration, they say, will lead to gun confiscation. Uh, if you look at the polls, it turns out gun registration is very popular. However, if you look at the laws, it turns out that gun registration is not implemented at the federal level and is not implemented in most states. Uh, and the reason is there is a small but very serious minority that strongly opposes gun registration. And we know, we talk to political scientists, political scientists will tell you that it is often the case that a small minority can block majority view if the small minority feels very strongly and the majority feels very weakly. There are all sorts of mechanisms through which this happens. I'm, by the way, not at all faulting those mechanisms. It may, in fact, be perfectly sensible that if a minority, even if small, they feel really strongly about something, maybe they should prevail in that situation. But the question is, why should they feel strong about it? Why should we worry that gun registration, one argument is gun registration will lead to gun confiscation. The question is why? So let's look at some possible mechanisms, each of which I will also talk about in some more detail later. So here's one argument I've sometimes made. Maybe gun registration will change the psychological environment in which gun confiscation is going to be considered. 
maybe gun registration will alter people's attitudes about confiscation. So right now, there's not a lot of support for gun confiscation, especially if it means doing house-to-house -house searches through people's homes and so on and so forth. But maybe gun registration will change people's views and will lead them to support gun confiscation. But again, why would that be so? One answer, I, I recall having a conversation once, somebody said, well, maybe gun registration will make people think that you don't really have a right to own a gun. It's just a matter of, of government favor, that if government does you a favor of letting you own a gun, after all, it's imposing these restrictions, such as registration on it. As a result, people will be more open to confiscation. I'm not sure that's right. You know, we, you have to register to vote, doesn't mean you don't have a right to vote. You have to register your marriage, doesn't mean you don't have the right to marry. In fact, the value of a marriage often is precisely that it's registered and makes you entitled to various government benefits. Uh, you, we register your cars. I don't think people say, oh, well, that's just the first step towards confiscating cars. So I, th I will explain later on why I think this attitude to altering slippery slope is a mechanism that sometimes operates. It just doesn't seem terribly plausible here. But remember, the title of this talk is Mechanisms of the Slippery Slope. But one of the big points is there are actually a lot of things, a lot of different ways in which the slippage might be able to happen. So let's turn to the next one. What if gun registration will be one of several small steps that unnoticed will end up equaling confiscation? They put them together, they'll become confiscation, even though each one on its own will kind of, to use another metaphor, be under the radar. People won't notice it. Uh, Libertarians love to tell a, a, the parable of the boiling frog. And he goes kind of like this. You put a frog into hot water, into boiling water, it will jump out because it realizes that the water is too hot. But you put the frog in cold water and you turn up the heat and the frog won't notice the slow, gradual increase in the heat until it's too late, until it boils and the frog is dead. Now, a parent, I've not conducted this experiment myself, Apparently, those who have conducted it report that frogs do not behave this way, real frogs. Real frogs jump out when the water gets too hot. Uh, but for our purposes, the metaphorical frog is a much more useful animal than the real frog, in part because I think this reflects, reflects an understanding of the way the world works. First, it reflects the way of understanding the world works about heat. You all know if you go in to get into a really hot jacuzzi or hot uh, a bathtub, it feels very hot, but if you gradually increase the heat, uh, then it doesn't feel that hot. Uh, but also, I think in some situations we do see, and we'll explain later on why that might be so, we do see why small steps might not be noticed by people, but a, a, whereas a large step would have been noticed. Yet a bunch of small steps that would equal a large step. So sometimes we'll make this argument about bans on particular kind of guns. Say, so, well, what's wrong with banning 50 caliber rifles? Why do you need a 50 caliber rifle? One objection may be, well, you ban 50 caliber rifles, then you ban so-called Saturday night special, sort of small, cheap guns, then you ban supposed assault weapons, then you ban other semi-automatics. Eventually, you'll ban everything. That's a possible argument. But it isn't an argument that seems per terribly persuasive to me when it comes to registration. Because even if you aggregate a whole bunch of registrations, you don't get to confiscation. Even if you have city-level registration, and county-level, and state-level, and federal-level, the result may be a hassle, may be extra paperwork, but it doesn't mean confiscation. So again, I think that argument operates in some places. It doesn't seem to be terribly likely here. Again, I'm not talking about this argument as if we can, these arguments as if we can come up with an answer once and for all. Does this argument work or doesn't it work? Well, it works in some cases and not other cases. The best we can do is figure out how to analyze it, how to understand it. Here's another argument, also using uh, metaphors, which I will unpack a little bit later on. Gun registration will increase the momentum, the political momentum of pro-confiscation forces. Um, and we've all, if we've watched, if we've paid any attention to politics, we see that sometimes it looks like there's momentum behind some movement. It wins in one situation. At first, we thought it was, wasn't going to win. But it wins in one case, then wins the next one. And all of a sudden, it looks almost like it's irresistible. Uh, so that's possible. You can imagine something like that. You can imagine the concern isn't so much with this proposal, but that this proposal will empower, by giving extra political momentum, will empower the pro-gun control movement. And as a result, it will, the movement will win again and again, and eventually will win on gun confiscation. So that's actually a plausible argument. But note how sensitive it is to the particular proposal being made. Let's say the proposal is 
not just to register guns, but register guns, but at the same time provide some deregulation of guns. Compile, combine registration of guns with, let's say, interstate recognition of uh, concealed carry licenses. If both sides win a little and lose a little, it doesn't look like it's going to change the momentum at all. Uh, here's another possible argument. Uh, what if it'll reduce gun ownership and thus increase the relative political power of anti-gun forces? So this is a little complicated, but, but let's think a little bit about this. Um, uh, it seems pretty clear that one's attitudes towards guns may influence whether one owns guns. If you think that guns are very bad, you probably won't own a gun. If you think that guns are good, you probably will own a gun, or at least more likely to own a gun. But it's also possible it might go the other way. Maybe if you own guns, you'll be more likely to take seriously gun rights or be really interested in gun rights because people value rights more if they exercise them. Maybe if you own guns and your kids grow up in a household that owns guns, they will come to think of guns as a dangerous thing to be sure, like a car or a knife or other things, but something that's a tool that's perfectly normal to have around. Whereas if there are fewer such households, then fewer people will grow up that way, and more people will grow up sympathetic to gun confiscation. This is a concern about not just what's happening now, but what may happen a generation from now. That's a possible argument, though again, note how sensitive it's to the particular proposal. Gun registration, after all, doesn't necessarily need to reduce gun ownership. If gun registration is expensive or difficult or risky, maybe it'll reduce gun ownership. But if it's just very, very simple, uh, just something that the gun dealer has to send in uh, to, uh, to uh, the Justice Department uh, when you're already conducting a, a transaction with him, uh, then maybe it won't have this effect. So, so far, it doesn't seem like there's much slippery slope risk. But what about this? What if gun registration lowers the cost of gun control? Why isn't there much of a movement to confiscate guns? Well, I think there may be two reasons. One reason is that some people say, no, 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 I believe in gun rights. It's really important that people have the right to have guns. Of course, we can't confiscate them. Others may say, you know, I'm not wild about people owning guns, but they're out there. There are 300 million guns out there. We're not going to be able to go out there and seize all of them, in part because it would be so expensive. It requires so much police effort. It would be expensive in terms of risk to police officers. It would be an intrusion on people's privacy, including privacy of non-gun owners, if police have to do house-to-house -house searches for guns. So as a result, maybe the opposition to gun confiscation is a combination of these two, two views. But let's say guns are registered. Let's assume gun registration is indeed uh, uh, successful in that most people, or almost all people who own guns, actually register their guns. Well, then what will happen is now the government will know who owns the guns. And the public will know the government knows who owns the guns. And the government knows the public knows the government knows who owns the guns. So five years from now, somebody says, well, gun registration, that was not enough. We should ban guns and we should confiscate them, either all guns or certain kinds of guns. People say, well, that's ridiculous. It's so expensive. Well, no, it used to be expensive. Now it's cheap. Now we have this gun registry. We tell everybody, you have to turn in your guns. They know that if they're registered as owning a gun, and they don't turn in their gun, then in that case, we'll be, we'll be going after them. So lots of people will turn in their guns. Only a small fraction will keep them. And those houses, yes, we can search. And what's more, maybe it'll make it more legally permissible. Right now, doing house-to-house -house searches looking for guns doesn't just violate the Second Amendment, it violates the Fourth Amendment, because that becomes a general search without probable cause. But maybe if somebody is registered as owning a gun, and doesn't turn over the gun when the gun is banned, maybe that is probable cause to believe he's still keeping the gun in his home. Now this, I think, these are arguments that are not as easy to dismiss. If indeed gun registration is enacted, it will lower the cost of gun confiscation. Things that cost less are consumed more. That's true for public policies as well as for products. A legislature is more likely to enact a low cost a measure than a high cost measure. Now note, you might say, well, all right, all right. But all this means is that gun registration will increase the risk of gun confiscation from 0.0001% to 0.001%. So it'll increase it, but it'll increase it from a tiny, tiny amount to another tiny, tiny amount. Because I think just the bottom of the slope is so politically unlikely. Plausible argument. Or you might say, well, it'll increase it, but the value of gun registration is so high it's just such an important crime-fighting tool that we've got to run this risk. Also plausible. I'm skeptical that it's much of a 
crime fighting tool, but I could see that argument. Or you could even say, look, the public is clamoring for some kind of gun control. If we don't give them gun registration, they'll just demand something more. So maybe in some situations you have the opposite effect. Maybe taking step A will decrease the likelihood of step A. I'm not at all suggesting that slippery slope phenomena are the only phenomena that are out there. But I do think that this shows that there's some situations in which there's a pretty serious slippery slope risk, at least through some of these mechanisms, though not through others. Now, let me shift away from guns. Give you another example, and that's privacy. Uh, there's been a lot of debate about whether there ought to be cameras in public places pervasively surveilling us. In England, that's actually pretty prominent. Uh, it's been adopted. Some debate about whether it's effective or not. In America, generally, not, hasn't been adopted any formal way, although there are enough such cameras out there that, that uh, law enforcement sometimes takes advantage of. Uh, so let's say we're in a situation where there are no cameras. Position zero. Nothing has been implemented. And somebody suggests, let's implement cameras. What's more, let's implement them a whole hog. We'll set up the cameras. We'll keep all of the data they record indefinitely. We're going to run facial recognition software. We're going to data mine it to within an inch of its life in order to get the maximum information about crime, about terrorism, about everything else. Uh, and that's proposal B. Uh, and uh, proposal B polls at 60%, which would normally be enough to get it enacted. We are, after all, the democracy. Uh, uh, and if you're thinking, well, it's unconstitutional, no, it turns out that there's nothing unconstitutional about having this pervasive surveillance, whether or not it's a good idea. But let's assume that 30% of the public, regardless of their views on the merits, just say cameras are just too expensive. It just co will cost us too much to have all these cameras everywhere and every light pole in, in the city. Well, now the 60% falls to 42%. That's not enough to get enacted, right? So somebody says, well, let's implement a, an intermediate proposal. Proposal A, let's put up the cameras but recycle the data after 24 hours. Unless somebody says, oh, no, no, there was a crime here. In which case, then we'll save it. We'll use it in order to try to catch the criminals, uh, prosecute them, and so on and so forth. And that pulls at 20%. The theory being, some people say, look, we like the crime-fighting effects of A. We're not wild about B, because that's too likely to be misused for the government to fight its political enemies. But A is good. Now, of course, not all 20% support it. 30% of those peel away in any case because of cost concerns. But the result is 14% support this. Well, now we've got a situation that if the middle group votes for A, A will get 56% of the vote. That's more than a majority. A gets implemented. Then, five years later, somebody says, well, why is it that we have these cameras? We spent all this money on them, and they're out there, and we're not really using them in the most thorough possible way. Why don't we actually decripple them? Put, why don't we keep the data? Why don't we analyze it? Uh, then. So they propose B. Now B gets 60% of the vote. No, group A still opposes B. But instead of 42%, we get 60% of the vote because now there's not much extra expense with the proposal. The camera is already out there. There are sunk cost. The investment's already made. So 0 to B fails, but 0 to A followed by A to B succeeds, and irreversibly so. Now group A at this point is kicking itself. They are saying, we should have read Volokh's mechanisms, the slippery slope. Because he would have warned us that this seemingly a very appealing proposal A could lead to really bad results B. Uh, and we didn't think about that. And now we, through our actions, have changed the economic circumstances in which B is being considered. And as a result, now, group, uh, now the result that's kind of the worst possible for us, B, we've facilitated it happening. We've enabled others our fellow voters who disagree with us, to implement something we, we don't like, and now it's too late. So that's a, that's a form of uh, cost-slowing slippery slope. And again, I, you can see this in uh, the guns context. You can see it in the privacy context. You can see it in lots of things. Let me offer another example. Uh, let's look at drug policy. Imagine we're in a situation where um, drugs, a particular kind of drug is legal. So we're in position zero. This kind of drug is legal. And what are A and B? A is let's implement mild restrictions on the drug. 
uh, maybe make it illegal to sell it, implement kind of mild penalties and the like. And B is full on war on drugs. Make it, impose very harsh penalties, impose intrusive searches and so on and so forth. So there are three possible options, zero A and B. And as you know from your math classes, that means there are six possible ways you can rank zero A and B. And therefore, the, the public might be divided into six different groups, depending on the rank. So group number one would say zero is best, A is second best, B is worst. Those are people who think there's just nothing wrong with this kind of drug. Say the drug is marijuana, hey, you know, it's an intoxicant, but a really mild intoxicant, just fine. People should be free to have their fun. Group six is the flip side, B, A, zero. Drugs are bad, do as much as you can to stop them. I'd prefer to have a full on war on drugs. If not that, at least I want to have some kind of restriction. The worst possible scenarios are one, one we're in. Now, group three and four are the compromisers. They say, yes, mild restriction is good, but harsh enforcement is very bad. Or mild restriction is good, no restriction is very bad, harsh enforcement is at the second best. So these are all groups we're all familiar with. Either one group is on the one side, another group on the other side, and then some groups in the middle. But here are two other options, and here there are ones who think that this intermediate position, the mild restriction position, is actually the worst of the lot. And why would they think that? Maybe because they think that if you have a mild restriction, nobody's going to pay attention to it. And as a result, you'll see the law being flouted, and that's bad for law and order. It's bad for respect for the law. So their view, group two says, look, we're libertarians as to drugs. We're, we're in favor, generally speaking, of allowing this drug. But hey, if you're going to ban it, at least go whole hog because otherwise you're going to have the worst possible position, uh, this intermediate position. Group five says, look, we're in favor of a war on drugs. But if you're not going to have, we'll be willing to have a serious war on drugs, then just keep it legal, because the worst possible position, if you have a mild restriction that nobody uh, is uh, paying attention to, that just breeds disrespect for the law. So now let's look at how the voting goes. And let's assume, and I think this is a fair assumption, ask the political scientists in the room, I think they'll tell you this is right, let's assume that it takes more than 50% in order to uh, enact a law. Let's say it takes at least 55%. Because usually, especially in our system with all these checks and balances, a bare majority is not enough. Uh, ooh, don't I have some here? Huh. That's odd. I don't like that. I don't want to look at that. OK, well, all right. Ah, here it is. Here it is. It came up. So if you look at a proposal to go from a current state, no uh, drug ban, uh, war on drugs, you just need to see all those places that list B as preferable to zero. Those are groups four, five, and six. By hypothesis, I'm just picking the numbers out of thin air. Uh, uh, we don't know what the poll results are, but let's assume they're 10, 10, and 30. That's only 50% to move to a full-on war on drugs. Somebody says, okay, that's not going to pass. Let's at least have this mild restriction. How many prefer A to zero? Well, it's group three, four, and six. Well, that's 20 plus 10 plus 30. That's 60%. Group A, uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, proposal A is now, now wins. Uh, there are, uh, there's this mild restriction. People, of course, flout it. The law is not being enforced. People start grumbling. Why do we have this law if it's not being enforced that just breeds disrespect for the law? Let's actually go out there and enforce it whole hog. Well, but you need the votes. Do you have the votes for that? Well, let's see what happens when there's a proposed move from A to B. Let's look at all the situations where B is preferred to A. Group two thinks B is better than A. Five thinks B is better than A. Six thinks B is better than A. 20% plus 10 plus 30, that's 60%. So even though proposal to move from zero to B doesn't win, from 0 to A and then from A to B, that does win with super majorities. And B to 0 doesn't win either, so it's, we don't cycle back. So here's another example of where here, because of what I call the enforcement needs slippery slope, the enactment of proposal A creates this perception that harsher enforcement is necessary and thus changes the political um, framework in which this war on drugs proposal is being considered. The result? Group, again, the groups that, that facilitated position A end up often regretting their result, especially group two, uh, which would have, uh, which, uh, uh, no, I'm sorry, it's uh, the group that most regrets the result uh, 
uh, is uh, uh, a group, uh, uh, group four, uh, which likes A but doesn't like B, well, now they get the B that they don't like. Um, all right, let me talk a little bit more about some of the other kinds of slippery slopes, and then we'll have time for questions and answers. So remember, I, we started talking about attitude altering slippery slopes. Uh, and one question you might ask is, why would anybody's attitude be actually altered by a legislative decision? Let me give you a quote from Charles Krauthammer. Krauthammer is a conservative columnist, but like quite a few conservatives, he's no supporter of gun rights. In fact, he is on the record as supporting a total ban on guns. At, shortly after the assault weapons ban was enacted at the federal level in the mid-1990s, he wrote a column praising that. And he says, look, the assault weapons ban is a purely symbolic move in the direction of disarming the citizen. It isn't going to reduce crime. Its only justification is desensitize the public to regulation of weapons in preparation for their ultimate confiscation. De-escalation begins with a change of mentality. The real steps, like banning handguns, will never occur unless the assault weapons ban is taken first. So he doesn't just believe in the slippery slope. He wants the slippage. He wants to, to slide down that slope. And the faster, the better. So that's not a normal slippery slope argument. Usually slippery slope argument is don't step on the slope. But still, his empirical claim, his predictive claim, is exactly the same. He says, yes, there is a slippery slope. I just think that it's worth stepping out on because of the bottom, whereas others oppose stepping out onto it because of the bottom. But again, the question is, why should we think this is so? Why should we think that an assault weapons ban will have symbolic value? Why do people care about symbolism here? Uh, why would it desensitize the public? Why would it uh, change mentality? Why would something Congress does change the mentality among us as voters? We voters should be changing the mentality of Congress, not Congress changing our mentality. Well, I think the crowd hammer, who's a pretty savvy political observer, has a point here. And the one way of thinking about it is bringing up another example. Um, hmm. Ah, OK. Uh, another example, um, uh, this one from, uh, from uh, uh, right after September 11th. Uh, after September 11th, there was this proposal, which by today's standards looks very tame, given all we've learned since then. And the proposal was something called carnivore. And that would have been an FBI program that would monitor or would, would gather, and shouldn't say monitor, would gather information about uh, uh, the email addresses with which people have corresponded and the uh, websites that they've visited. And uh, uh, it um, wouldn't read the email without a warrant, because it was pretty clear you couldn't read an email without a warrant. But it would just gather the header information, which addresses someone has corresponded with or which sites they've visited. And that would be without warrants. And here's the way the argument went. And I know this because I participated briefly in this argument. One side says, look, warrantless searches for dialed phone numbers are allowed. There's a case from the late 1970s that tell the government if it was monitoring you, it could get from the phone company a list of all of the phone numbers that you have dialed or that have dialed you. Again, to tap your line, it needs probable cause, but it doesn't need that just for the phone numbers. Um, and some people said, look, this is just like warrantless searches. Therefore, it should, it's good. Others said, no, no, no. It's more intrusive than warrantless searches. Therefore, it's bad. What nobody said, some thought, but almost nobody said was, look, warrantless searches for phone numbers, sure, the Supreme Court upheld them, but it was wrong. Or even if it was right that they're constitutional, it doesn't mean they're a good idea. Why should we take this step that was taken in the late 1970s and go even further? Maybe that step was mistaken, but nobody was saying that. The assumption was the Supreme Court said this is OK, and therefore, the public's going to assume it's OK. But why? The answer, I think, is something that economists call rational ignorance. Ignorance sounds bad, but ignorance is inevitable. All of us are ignorant about a vast range of things. And this is right that we should be ignorant about that, because there's way too much any one person, for any one person to learn. If we know a lot about auto mechanics, we probably won't know a lot about plumbing. We know a lot about plumbing. We probably won't know a lot about auto mechanics. If we know a lot about both of those things, there are going to be other things we're going to be ignorant about. So what do we do when we're rationally ignorant about something? We tend to trust the experts. We tend to trust authoritative institutions. So for many people, not for all people, but for many people, if the Supreme Court said something or if Congress said something and they don't know much about the subject, they're probably pretty inclined to trust the court and Congress. They're pretty inclined to have their attitudes altered. Because they say, look, maybe those people are wrong 
30% of the time, but we're wrong 50% of the time because we know that we don't actually know much about this field. So as a result, this rational ignorance makes it possible for people's attitudes to be changed by what they learn about what the government has done. Again, a first step in this case, the allowance of warrantless searches for dialed phone numbers changes the psychological environment in which future steps are considered. Small change tolerance, remember our frog? Also closely related. Uh, a lot of people say, look, I don't have time for the small stuff. You come to me with some modest, modest regulation of guns, speech, abortion, whatever else, I'm not even going to be worried about it if it's so small. Uh, this is what I call small change tolerance, relatedly small change deference. Hey, if Congress is proposing it and it's just a small thing, I'm inclined to defer to their judgment. Uh, and also desire to avoid seeming petty. Do you want to get the reputation as the kind of person who always makes a big stink out of every tiny little gun regulation uh, you hear about? Well, you might if you travel in the right circles, but in other circles you might want to save your powder, or excuse me, keep your powder dry, uh, another metaphor, uh, for the really big things. What might happen, though, is the big thing won't happen. What will happen is a whole bunch of small things that will add up to the big thing. And then again, it's too late. Political power slopes. Uh, here's an example that uh, uh, I got from a conversation with a colleague of mine who is a uh, big fan of uh, uh, marijuana legalization. He's a drug policy expert. He's in favor of keeping most drugs illegal, but marijuana he thinks should be legalized. But he says marijuana should be legalized, but only for personal consumption. You should, there shouldn't be a market for, uh, for it. People shouldn't be able to sell it. You should only grow it for their own purposes. Uh, and uh, uh, that's so because he, does, he says, I don't want all the wilds of Madison Avenue uh, to be used in order to maximize people's consumption of marijuana through advertising. But I say, say Mark, or his name's Mark Kleinman. Mark, uh, I have a brown thumb. Uh, I, uh, if you make me grow my own marijuana, I probably won't be able to. And what's more, I believe in division of labor. If we really do think marijuana should be legal, why not have it be grown the way other crops are grown by people who specialize in growing them and who participate in the market? And if you care about advertising, why don't you just say, we'll legalize marijuana but ban marijuana advertising? Not so fast, Volokh, he says. Look, you legalize marijuana sales, or you could imagine gambling or whatever else, but ban the advertising. Once you've legalized the product and legalized it for commercial production, you've changed the political environment. You've now created this powerful, wealthy industry that has money that can contribute, but even set aside money. Has employees, has suppliers, has other business partners who have employees, and they're going to pressure their senators, their congressmen, in order to lift the advertising ban if they really think that, uh, uh, that advertising is good for their business. So again, as a result, uh, step A looks modest. Step A is just doesn't allow the, the uh, the, the advertising, but it creates a condition that is politically unsustainable, that politically you won't be able to resist the pressure created by this industry that you have created. The last example I want to give is the political momentum slopes, and I want to return for a moment to guns. This is from Chuck Schumer, now a senator from New York. Back then he was a representative. This is around the same time as the assault weapons ban. And here's what he says. Uh, this marks a turning point. The stranglehold of the NRA of Congress is now broken. They had this aura of invincibility, and they were beaten. And the implication is because there's no more stranglehold, we in the gun control movement can win more battles still. Turns out he was wrong. Turns out that was the last federal gun control that was enacted. And actually following, there was the, the assault weapons ban expired. There, uh, there were actual liberalization of, of uh, federal gun laws in some respects and such. But though he was wrong, I don't think he was stupid. I think he made a plausible prediction. But the question is why? Why is it that the NRA's victory uh, or defeat, in this case defeat in the assault weapons ban, why is it that he predicted that it would actually affect their success or failure in future proposals? Well, I think this also has to do with rational ignorance, but rational ignorance about something else. And that is rational ignorance about the power of groups. Legislators and voters care about whether the NRA is powerful or not. Imagine you're a legislator. NRA comes to you and says, look, uh, we want you to, uh, to vote against this proposal. Now, some congressmen might be worried about, uh, about uh, NRA's the, the contributions, but the fact is that's not what most congressmen care about with regard to the NRA. NRA just doesn't have that much money to throw around. It has some, but not that much. 
what they have is they have supporters. They have a, a, a large group of people who really feel very deeply about this. And the congressmen are scared. Uh, of those, and rightly so. In, in, in a democracy, politicians should be scared of reactions of the voters, but they want to know, is the NRA really that powerful? We keep hearing about how powerful they are. Are they really that powerful? There's no way they can figure that out directly, right? There's no pow powerometer that they can, they can stick out and say, ooh, bzz, bzz, bzz. okay, fine, your power level is 7.3. The only way they know about the power of the NRA or the ACLU or NARAL or any other group is by looking at their track record. And that means that if the NRA, uh, uh, if, uh, the NRA loses on Proposal A, legislators will view that as a proxy, as a predictor of its likely power on B. So yes, Schumer, I think, was right. If the NRA loses one battle, and then the next time it comes around trying to get congressmen to vote its way, congressmen will be somewhat less influenced by them because their estimated power from the congressman's perspective will now be less because they have shown themselves powerless to resist the previous regulation. Again, it turns out it didn't play out this way in this particular battle, but the political momentum slope, I think, is quite real. Let me close. Slippery slopes exist. They're not the only thing that are out there, but they are. They, they, do, they do exist. Slippery slope arguments are sometimes sound. I can't give you a formula to figure out whether that when they're sound. It's certainly not the case that all slippery slope arguments are sound or no slippery slope arguments are sound, but I hope this gives you a sense of how to evaluate each particular argument. Arguments operate in several different ways. If you want to consider the risk of the slippery slope, you need to think about each one of the possible mechanisms. Concern isn't that somehow we won't be able to stop short of the bad result. And kind of by getting out of the slippery slope, we will inevitably slide down to the bottom. If we think that the bottom is bad, we'll, we won't vote for it. But others might vote for it. And then we will, be, we will regret this, uh, re regret having enabled that vote by our support of step A, which changed, again, the economic, political, or psychological circumstances under which B is considered. And let me close with one other thing. This suggests there's a plausible rule of thumb that some groups, like the NRA, like the ACLU, like uh, um, uh, pro-choice groups or pro-life groups or whatever else might have, and that is avoid small cost, small benefit proposals. If somebody says, oh, look, let's do this regulation, it's a very, very um, uh, uh, slight regulation, what's the big deal? Why are we being so unreasonable? Why are you being so fanatical? A lot of these groups get a lot of this. Why, you're being fanatical and unreasonable for opposing the small proposal. Maybe they're not being so unreasonable after all. Maybe they worry and plausibly, uh, I'm sorry, worry and worry plausibly that uh, uh, there is no small cost proposal, at least guaranteed small cost proposal. Maybe each one of these proposals may actually have a large cost proposal lurking behind it down at the bottom of the slope. And if that's so, this kind of militant, we will oppose all restrictions, at least unless there's a tremendously great benefit to the restrictions, that kind of approach may be a sensible one for those things you re where you really, really care about avoiding the bottom of the slope. So with that, I close. And I think we have time for questions. Yeah, you can, you can find one you like and give it to me, and then I'll read it. All right. So somebody, uh, so here's a question. Ebola quarantine, constitutional concerns or no concern? Due process issues, question mark. I like that. Very simple, short, to the point. Uh, it's also, of course, a question that may have nothing to do with slippery slopes. My co-blogger, Eugene Kantorovich, uh, uh, on the, the Vala conspiracy blog that I run, uh, posted an item, uh, <coughs> excuse me, posted an item uh, that uh, uh, discuss some of the constitutional and legal issues here uh, uh, on the subject. So I don't want to, to, to duplicate that, uh, um, uh, especially since the issues are not as such slippery slope questions. But there is a very serious slippery slope argument with all these things, right? Look, even if we think it's okay to have an Ebola quarantine, quarantine of people who are coming back from West Africa, is could that start a slippery slope? Once the government is entitled to just lock us up, not because we're guilty of any crime, not because we're proven to uh, be sick, but because we might be sick, is that going to lead to more such things in the future? 
both quarantines, but also more broadly, more broad restrictions uh, uh, on liberty where the government says, oh, you might be dangerous, not maybe because of your ideas and not because of the disease you might be carrying. I think that's a very serious issue, and I'm glad that people are thinking about it. Because it's true that once you authorize one restriction on liberty, in our system of, of law, but also system of political argument, where precedent ends up being really often referred to, you can bet that it, might, that it will be used at some point as precedent for something else. Here's why I think that it's not that much of a slippery slope concern. And we could go through each one of these genres of our, uh, excuse me, each one of these genres of mechanism, but I don't want to go through all of all that. I think there are very, very powerful forces that prevent excessive quarantining. There are very powerful political forces along those lines. If you if you are worried about the government using quarantine power in order to suppress a position or some such, I don't think that that's something you need to worry about. Uh, because, uh, first of all, quarantine is very expensive. Locking people up costs a lot of money. But also, it's not the, it's not the, sort, of, uh, it's the sort of thing that most people, their first reaction is, well, wait a minute. That could be me. If this is generally authorized, and I end up having a suspicious seeming cough or a fever or whatever else, it could be me who's locked up. Uh, it's not something that's going to be popular um, as a general matter. Uh, and as a result, I don't think one needs to worry too much about this first step, changing the political or psychological uh, or even economic environment that will bring us down to the bottom of the slippery slope to where people are being locked up as a pretext or people are being locked up for, uh, for very minor illnesses. It's just something where there's too much political, likely political opposition, regardless of whether the first step is taken. Now, I may be wrong on this. This is part of the problem is you're trying to make predictions about the future here. But I don't think that that's terribly likely. Now, if there had been a movement for very broad quarantine uh, of, uh, of people on a wide range of, uh, in a wide range of situations, I would be a lot more worried about first steps uh, that, that increase this likelihood. But I'm not terribly worried about it here. One other analogy uh, um, that comes to mind, I wrote a law review article about, about this, uh, is some people object to same-sex marriage on the grounds that it may increase, lead to government recognition of polygamy. I think that's not a ridiculous argument. I think it's possible this might happen. But again, one reason we're seeing a movement for same-sex marriage is there's pretty broad public political support for this. Uh, uh, maybe not enough to just legalize it through the political process throughout the country, which is why it's going through the courts, but still pretty broad support. Lots of people have family members who are gay, lots of people who have friends who are gay. They sympathize with gays and lesbians who are interested in engaging in same-sex marriage. My sense is there's very little public political support for uh, legal recognition of polygamy, uh, either in the political process or in the judicial process. Again, I might be wrong, but I think that's so, and I don't think it's likely to change. So, so uh, that's why I think you might object to same-sex marriage on various grounds, but probably not on that one. That's, I don't think, a very likely worry or a very serious worry to have. Uh, because as a practical matter, I just don't think, even with the extra oomph that might be provided by this first step, I don't think there will be, at least in the foreseeable future, the political support for government recognition uh, of, of polygamous marriages and, uh, and the like. So this is just a reflection of one thing that I already said. It's not like a slippery slope argument is the only thing that's in play. The fact that some, some um, uh, first step might increase the risk of slippage doesn't really tell us necessarily whether that risk is very great. Another way of thinking about it is some slopes may not be going like this. They may be going like this. And if that's so, because there's very little political pressure to get to the bottom of the slope and a lot of political resistance to it, maybe taking that first step won't cause that much harm after. Uh, so I think, so I think there are, there are a bunch of different, um, different things in play in, uh, with regard to detention of, uh, uh, detention of, uh, <coughs> excuse me, um, uh, 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 of enemy combatants. One question is, do you keep them in Guantanamo or do you keep them somewhere else? I think that is an uh, that is a oddly overstressed question on both sides. 
I don't really see why it would be that much uh, better for liberty or that much worse for national security to bring uh, these uh, combatants and, and uh, uh, house them in some secluded corner of Texas or the Mojave Desert. Uh, I, I, it's not like, oh, the fact they're on an island is what keeps, keeps them in prison. The fact that they're in a prison keeps them in prison. Uh, uh, now, it, the, reason, the reason that they were housed in Guantanamo was in large part because of a legal thought that if you house them outside of the U.S. territory, American courts won't intercede uh, and won't hear habeas corpus claims brought by them. But that's been, that battle has been fought and lost by the government. At this point, the Supreme Court has said, yes, we will hear habeas corpus claims for them, from them. So I, I think the Guantanamo thing is a red herring. But there's a broad, deeper question here, which is, what about the fact that we are keeping people who are locked up, uh, lo not because there's proof beyond a reasonable doubt, decided through the normal processes of American criminal procedure that they're guilty of a crime, but because there's some sufficient suspicion held by some government officials without much, um, without much accountability to courts and with no accountability to juries. That's the concern. Uh, and I think that's a serious concern, in part because unlike with a quarantine, it's a lot more plausible that the government would use enemy combatant designations in order to lock up its enemies. Uh, it could just say, look, you know, we don't have to show that you were recently in West Africa. We don't have to show you have symptoms. We don't have to, we aren't going to lock you up just for 21 days. We're going to lock you up for years because somebody gave us some classified information that suggests that you are dangerous and you're in league with the bad guys. You could certainly imagine that being used as, a, uh, uh, as an excuse, and I think much more easily than you can imagine quarantine being used as an excuse, uh, for, uh, for the government to... Uh, um, uh, getting rid of or, uh, uh, or taking off the political stage people who it just thinks are, are dangerous to. This having been said, again, I think this is not something which worries me too much for a couple of reasons. One is we have seen this going on for 13 years, and it hasn't really been abused that way. Uh, doesn't, I mean, there may be problems with it, and maybe there are some people who are locked up who shouldn't be locked up because they were locked up on faulty intelligence, but we haven't seen uh, the administration uh, uh, finding its domestic political enemies and locking them up this way. The other thing is there is a lot, of, a lot of historical precedent for this. Similar things had been done during pretty much all of the wars. Uh, a military detention of enemy combatants has been done throughout pretty much all of the major wars that we have fought. We haven't really seen much by way of abuse there. And on top of that, again, some of the time you have to step, step out on the slope, even though the bottom is very dangerous, because you think that step is really necessary. And when you are uh, uh, detaining people who are, especially ones who are captured in foreign battlefields, uh, and uh, you often don't have the kind of evidence that can be introduced in court that proves certain things, but there's really good reason to, to view them as enemy combatants. Uh, historically, that's the way that American and uh, law and uh, law of most Western democracies has, uh, has dealt with this, by authorizing military detention even during a very long, um, during a very long uh, 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 conflict. Uh, so I do think here there is a serious risk of uh, slippage, but I think the value of, uh, of having some kind of detention system, whether Guantanamo or elsewhere, for enemy combatants is a pretty serious uh, value. And on top of that, I think the track record so far suggests uh, uh, that this is unlikely to be abused. Is this the life of slipping down the slope? So I, uh, I remember, um, I, remember uh, uh, I was probably 19 or so when I decided to go to law school. I started when I was 21. But by then, I'd, I'd started work early uh, in my life uh, as a computer programmer. So by then, I'd already been working for seven years as a computer programmer. Uh, uh, and I had, uh, uh, I had uh, really enjoyed being a computer programmer. And I'd been pretty successful at being a computer programmer. And I worked for several more years until law school and through law school. I had a great career as a computer program. I was very pleased. I was just saying uh, to Larry County Public Schools was a customer of software that I wrote. Uh, and my recollection is they were very pleased with it. I, uh, um, uh, so, uh, uh, so I was wondering, 
why am I even thinking of going to law school? And I, uh, and I, I realized I wanted to go to law school because I wanted to live a semi-public life. I didn't want to be an elected official, which is good because then I would have to get people to vote for me, and they're not going to do that. Uh, so, uh, um, uh, but I wanted to participate in public controversies. Uh, and uh, I realized that in America, rightly or wrongly, the people who are involved in these things are lawyers. So, so I wanted to appear on talk shows. I wanted to file amicus briefs. I wanted to testify before congressional subcommittees. I wanted to go around and lecture people and persuade them of my way of thinking. And that's exactly what I've gotten. That's exactly what I've got. Now, is it a life, the perfect life, the life that I absolutely want? I maybe would have liked to have my articles cited a few more times. That would have been really nice. That would have been really nice. I might have wanted to have articles that are more worth citing. I'm very proud of this article. I'm pleased with this. I think I've written a bunch of pretty good articles. There certainly are scholars who've written articles who, that have blazed more trails than mine. And, uh, and uh, I respect that. And I wish I were more like that. So, it's not a perfect life, but it's a damn good life. If, you ever, if anybody ever lock, knocks on your door and says, hey, would you like a job as a law professor? The right answer is yes. No, because it's not my accomplishment. Uh, um, I, I was late coming to the party of... Uh, uh, a Second Amendment scholarship. I did have three of my articles cited by the Supreme Court. That was a very pleasant morning for me. Of course, I was happy about the result, too, for the nation and for myself, but, I, but particularly about those citations. Uh, I, I'm glad to do that, but boy, there have been other people who have been, who have been writing longer than I have uh, on the subject. Because they came earlier, they had done more of the most foundational work. The three articles I wrote, again, I, I think are nice articles, but they ended up filling a few gaps. Uh, and they, they deserve much, much more credit for this. It's a funny thing, Alan Gora, Alan Gora, really funny guy. He's a lawyer, lawyer for, um, uh, for Heller and then for McDonald, and since then has fought and won quite a few other uh, gun cases. Uh, kind of very, he, he's in a sense a quintessent, he, he, he's quintessentially stereotypical lawyer. He's kind of temperamentally brash and aggressive assertive in, I think, the best possible way. He, he's somebody who, he has a magnetic personality. He was born in Israel. He came over when he was two or three, I think. But he was born in Israel, and he comes to America and helps protect American constitutional values. And here I am, born in Russia. I, I like to think I help protect American constitutional values, too. So, so it's, it's nice that the American legal system allows an Israeli and a Russian uh, to help it out every so often. <laughs> but there are others who, uh, Alan Gura was tremendously important, but there are other scholars who are much more important uh, on the subject than, uh, than I am. Okay, so I have this question. You have a lot of different So, Balancing is another one of those metaphors, and it is the most dangerous metaphors are ones that look like they give you an answer, in part because they refer to something that in the physical world is uh, easily, uh, uh, th th that, that is not a metaphor, that it's a real phenomenon that operates through easily understandable ways. But it turns out what makes it dangerous is that in the legal world, in the policy world, that that ends up being more misleading than helpful. Uh, so if you think about balancing, how does balancing work? Uh, how does a scale work in, um, in the physical world? It's because you have two objects which are being compared along the same, along the same dimension. Uh, their, their weight uh, is being compared. And the way it works is gravity pulls on one. The same force gravity pulls on the other. And if you have them you have them set up so that the arms of the levers are of the same length, well, you can figure out, uh, figure out uh, uh, which one is heavier than the other. Because gravity does the job for you. You don't have to balance. Gravity balances it. But imagine somebody were to say, let, to, to use, use a famous line from Justice Scalia, uh, to adapt a famous line from Justice Scalia, let's balance the weight of this rock against the length of this stick. Their scale's not going to help you with that, right? 
Uh, now, you might say, OK, we'll use a scale for the rock, and we'll use a ruler for the stick. Well, all right, you can do that, but it doesn't tell you which one is bigger, because they're two completely different things. This is part of the problem with the notion of balancing individual rights against, uh, against uh, social interests or public order. They're incommensurable. Individual rights are valuable to individuals in particular ways. Public order is valuable in other ways. You can't, first of course, there is no mechanism for actually measuring the value of each, but even if you did, you wouldn't be able to compare them. Now, so I, I just think that calling it balancing makes it look like an easier phenomenon than it is. But the underlying reality, though, is that we want liberty, but we can't have unlimited liberty. One example of that in the privacy context is searches and seizures. People can be really militant Fourth Amendment maximalists, but the Fourth Amendment says no unreasonable searches and seizures. It says warrants shall not be issued except for probable cause. But that means that when there is probable cause, warrants can be issued, right? So the Fourth Amendment recognizes that we can't have complete security from searches and seizures. We only have some degree of security. We can't have complete prohibition on warrants. We allow warrants when there's probable cause, which is a pretty manipulable uh, rule. The free speech clause is not articulated in that uh, overtly restrictive way. It does says Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech. But nobody really thinks that freedom of speech should include your freedom to say your money or your life to somebody in a dark alley. And let's assume no money changes hands because the person runs away. Let's assume you don't show a gun. So really, all you're doing is speaking. It's pretty broadly accepted that that can't be freedom of speech. And in fact, throughout American history, it hasn't been treated as, as freedom of speech. So I think that, that it is very, very, it's a very important question how you reconcile individual rights with public order concerns, when it is permissible to limit individual rights in the name of public order, or for that matter, undermine public order in the name of individual rights. Uh, I'm, I don't think there's a simple answer to this. In fact, in a sense, the work of the Supreme Court interpreting the Bill of Rights over the last 100 odd years, and in some respects over the last 200 years, has been an attempt, however imperfect, uh, uh, to answer this question. But I do think that ta talking about it as balancing kind of gives you a false sense that you've actually answered, or gives courts a false sense that they've actually answered the problem. Well, this is a different talk. I have a talk on gun control and gun policy. Uh, and uh, it's, an, uh, it's about as long as this one, and uh, we don't have time for that. Um, l but here's the short answer. There are things that gun control might plausibly do. I'm a skeptic about gun control. But there's no doubt that certain kinds of, uh, of uh, 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 gun control arguments, at the very least, have some plausibility. I think they're, co they're Costs outweigh the benefits. But you can certainly imagine the benefits. Here's a classic such argument. Uh, there are people out there who are generally law-abiding. If, uh, if you tell them you can't have a gun, they'll follow the law because most of the time they're law-abiding. But some of the time they get just really angry or they get drunk or something else happens, and then that's when they misuse their gun. And if we deny them guns, either through a comprehensive gun ban or by banning uh, gun possession by people who have domestic violence misdemeanor convictions or under restraining orders, then in that case, we might be able to prevent that class of crime. Uh, likewise, even if somebody's a criminal, uh, maybe if they're a relatively low motivated criminal, or let's say, let's say they're, they're a burglar, maybe if we ban guns, maybe then they'll burglarize people's homes without being armed. But if you're going to say, let's just take an, ex an extreme example, a contract killer. I'm going to get to the, quite to the specific thing here, but I just want to show a clear example. Contract killer is not going to be stopped by gun control. Contract killer is not going to say, oh, well, you know, I, I wouldn't want to violate the law against gun control, would I? Well, if you're willing to violate the law against murder, uh, you're not going to block a gun control law. Uh, so, so those are just not the kinds of crimes that you can prevent through gun control. Maybe there are other ways of trying to prevent them. Gun control probably is not it. And I think candid 
defenders of gun control law would say, look, that's, that's fine, Volokh, we agree. We're not gonna try, we're not gonna be able to stop the contract killers uh, through gun control law. But hey, there are at least a lot of people who sometimes get drunk and, uh, and do things that they that later regret. At least we can stop that. And again, maybe you, maybe you can, maybe you can't. I think on balance it's not a good idea even then, but at least that's a plausible argument. Now let's look at where, at where um, school shootings or other mass shootings fall in the picture. Here you've got somebody who's willing to, who's willing to uh, violate the law against murder. What's more, unlike the contract killer, this person is actually willing to get caught. It's extremely likely that he's going to get killed right there on the spot. If not, he might get executed, but even if it's in a state that re does not regularly execute people, he will be locked up in prison, in a very nasty prison, I am quite sure, for a very, very long time, I and mean, clearly for the rest of his life. So this is somebody who's willing to do all that. How are you going to get him to comply with gun control law? Now, one uh, and on top of that also, one thing that the, all of these crimes, I don't know yet about the Washington State one because not a lot has been said about this uh, so far, but uh, all the other, the previous shootings, they have been planned. This is not something that somebody says one morning, uh, you know, I'm in the mood. 15 minutes later, he's out there shooting. They plan. Uh, uh, Cle uh, Klebold and Harris, I think, uh, planned for a long time. So again, very hard to see how you're going to, how they're going to be deterred by gun People say, well, all right, maybe it won't be deterred, but they'll be incapacitated from it because, after all, they can't buy a gun. Uh, maybe if we totally ban guns, they won't be able to buy a gun. There are 300 million guns in America. Uh, it seems very, very hard for me to see how, again, somebody who is willing to violate the most serious of laws is going to be stopped because, well, it's just too hard. People can buy drugs, even though they're completely illegal. People can get drugs in prison. It seems hard for me to see how it is that you can, that you can actually stop someone uh, from getting a gun uh, uh, if they are that committed to uh, ruining the, their own life as well as the lives of others. Uh, so this isn't a dis by any means a dispositive answer against gun control. And on top of that, remember that mass shootings are probably claim 10 to 20 lives a year. Total homicides in the US are about 10 to 15,000, or 10 to 20,000, of which probably about 10 to 15,000 are, are with guns. This is not the tail that should be wagging the dog. So I'm not at all suggesting this is a comprehensive argument against gun control. But if we're going to have a debate about gun control, it should focus on the 99.9% .9 of all crimes, and maybe the some of them that could be stopped by gun control policies, and not these extremely unusual and extremely hard to stop crimes. Either one. Well, we have substance, so let's do a fun. Who's my favorite president and why? Uh, I, I'm an academic, and one of the things about being an academic is we, they usually tell us we have to have good reasons for things we say in our professional capacity. So if I were just chatting with you over dinner, I'd say, you know, I'm not really sure. I kind of like Ronald Reagan. He was right in this whole communism thing. Um, uh, we don't really know for sure about his economic policy. There are arguments for and against, but I think on balance it was pretty sound. If you're asking me as a scholar, my only answer has to be, I'm not a scholar of the presidency. There have been 44 of them. I would have to go out there and actually look pretty carefully at, at the record of each and figure out what the right metric for me to like them would be. And maybe there's some that are diamonds in the rough I haven't really paid close attention to. There's a Calvin Coolidge revival going on. Maybe, uh, maybe uh, uh, he, should be, he, he should be my favorite. George Washington, you know? A lot of people said a lot of really good things about him. Uh, so, so as a scholar, I cannot give you an answer. Uh, uh, as a person, you know, I'm, uh, George Washington, I think, was, was, should be pretty, uh, pretty highly regarded. Ronald Reagan, I pretty much like. Uh, but I can't, don't take this to the bank.